and this is our Zoom service uh, from the First Presbyterian Church in Lansing. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today's liturgist will be someone that I think you're familiar with, Dr. Nancy Timothy, and assisted by Sophie Faber. Um, invite your friends and neighbors to join us on these Zoom Sundays. Uh, it's a wonderful experience, except when we're late like this. Uh, but we had a good reason. Uh, please invite your friends to join us and eventually uh, uh, to come back to our century. Today's a very important day for our church. We will uh, be voting to extend a call to ministry to the PNC's chosen candidate. And we will be voting also to approve the terms of call for that candidate. And we will be hearing from that candidate shortly. Notes from the PNC. Harry, do you want to cover this one? Go ahead. You can read them. Well, June 30th is Pastor Nancy's last day, regardless of what happens to the voting today. <laughs> Nancy's, we've been keeping her around and torturing her long enough. Now, assuming that we extend a call to ministry to Jonathan, his official start date would be July 8th. His first day preaching to us from the pulpit would be July 11th. The first day as the First Presbyterian Church of Lansdowne full-time pastor will be July 12th. July 1 through 11 is emergency only. Leave messages on the church answering machine and one of the elders or some deacons or somebody will get back to you. The deacons fund and the food pantry, again, are proud of the, all your support for all the, their good work. Book group will meet May 23rd. Uh, get in touch with Rona. They're looking at a book called World of Wonders in praise of fireflies, whale sharks, and other astonishments. And if, if you think of firefly as teeny and whale sharks as big as anything, you can understand why they are calling it the World of Wonders. Get in touch with Rona. Email addresses at the church are now completely changed. The uh, First Presbyterian Church pastor, FPCL pastor, 140 at Gmail, FPC office, FPCL office, 140 at Gmail. Um, Nancy is on vacation with Joe May 31st to June 5th, and they're going to be at the shore, so don't call them. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Snyder from the Baptist Church will be covered. <clears throat> Your gifts and offerings uh, can be mailed. You now know all the different ways that you can do them. You can continue to stick them in, in a Nancy screen door if you want. But here. mail is a good way to do it or use Tiger online. Now it is. It was. This week, Monday, music and worship will meet at 7 o'clock. The open house on Tuesday at 10 o'clock will continue. Tuesday evening, Session will meet at 7.30. Wednesday, ladies' Bible study at 10.30, and Wednesday's open house at 7 p.m. will continue. We had our last uh, Fred Rogers uh, session today. It was wonderful, and uh, we need you to understand that if you are on a phone, star six will toggle mute on and off, star nine to raise your hand, Zoom settings, video off, audio on mute, and choose speaker mute. Thank you.
the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me in the responsive call to worship taken from Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord and in God's law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by the streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season. Their leaves do not wither. In all they do, they prosper. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let us worship God. Please join me in the unison invocation. Lord, you know our hearts. You ask us to follow you, but we hide from you and from others and from ourselves. On this day, we celebrate Jesus' ascension back to you. Remind us then that you overcame everything for us and that Jesus continues to rise above our problems, the world's difficulties, and even our own reluctance to love and serve your children. Guide teach and love us as you help us become who you call us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn is Hail the Day That Sees Him Rise. Nancy, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Let's start again. <laughs> I've had my ups and downs this week. Maybe you have too in being a disciple of Jesus. So I need to take a few minutes to confess some of the things I shouldn't have done or confess that I didn't do some of the things I should have. Let's spend a moment in silent prayer. And now let us pray together. Mighty and majestic God, how could we know you more fully than as you have revealed yourself in Jesus? How could we trust your love more completely than in seeing him suffer and die for us? 
How could we have more reassurance than knowing that Jesus ascended to heaven, that we might have life eternal? Forgive us when we often fail to understand. Forgive us when we so rarely share that good news. Forgive us when we so often take for granted all your loving gifts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends, hear the good news. In God's love for us, God even gave his beloved son. Believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Trust the good news. God's love and mercy will never fail. We are loved and forgiven. Let us now pray together our prayer of illumination. Great and almighty God, continue to give us your promised gifts that we may be empowered to obey your commands and be faithful disciples, sharing your love with all we meet. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, before we get to our scripture reading for the day, one of the things that I like to do before any sermon is to try and put whatever scripture reading into a bit of context, whether that's within a specific book of the Bible or the larger biblical narrative. Uh, so just a couple of things before we hear our word of scripture read by Miss Sophie. Our gospel reading for today is not the text for the celebration of the Ascension, even though it is Ascension Sunday. Uh, but it is the John chapter 17 text, which is the lectionary text for the Sunday in the lectionary. And it is a prayer prayed by Jesus to God. And some scholars now call it the high priestly prayer because of some of the language and the rhetoric that Jesus uses in it. And as we'll listen or hear this morning, uh, that will become apparent. It's one of those texts that sort of has some circular thinking to it. And, you know, it's helpful if you hear it multiple times or something like that. Uh, but what I want us to keep in mind as we hear the scripture read is that these are some of Jesus's last words uh, before his arrest in the garden during Holy Week. So in one sense, this is uh, sort of Jesus's farewell blessing and prayer for the community that has been formed around him during his ministry. So keep those things in mind as we uh, listen now for the word of the Lord. Take it away, Sophie. This is the gospel reading, John 17 verse 6 through 19. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know everything you have given me is for you. For the words that you give me to to me, I have given to them, and they have received them and known in truth that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf, I'm not asking on the behalf of the world, but on the behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them, and now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father, protect them in your name, that you will be given, okay. have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. 
I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except for the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and they and the world has hated them because they do not belong in the world, just as I do not belong in the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong in the world, just as I do not belong in the world. Significantly, them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Thank you, Sophie. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, so hello. Uh, before we begin the sermon, uh, I want to take a little bit of a just a brief moment and introduce myself formally. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Britt, and uh, the reason that I am preaching today is because at the end of this service, you, the members of Lansdowne Presbyterian Church, will be asked to vote on whether or not to call me as your next pastor, which I am super excited about. Uh, I've had several conversations with members of the PNC, and you may or may not know it, but I was actually sitting in the sanctuary uh, about a month ago when Nancy was showering my wife and I with more compliments than I think we had heard in a really long time. Um, and so that is, that is why I'm here. Uh, and it's because of this sort of unique situation and unique time that we find ourselves in uh, that I think today's scripture is so appropriate. So yes, it is the, lect the lectionary scripture for today, but those, um, but there are just some times when the lectionary sort of speaks to the situation that we find ourselves in, that it's hard to just sort of find that that's a coincidence. So that is why uh, I picked this scripture for today. So while the rest of the disciples and the world don't know it yet, Jesus's ministry is in transition. One scholar says that this prayer constitutes a transition in which the responsibility for God's word is passing from Jesus to his disciples. Even if he doesn't know the specifics of what is about to happen, we know that Jesus can see the writing on the wall and he is preparing his disciples and all those who follow him to keep going after he leaves. He knows that if his teachings are going to live on, if they are going to continue to make the world a better place, if the work of continuing to bring the kingdom of God on the earth as it is in heaven is to be fulfilled, then there are certain things that the community will still need to do when Jesus is not physically in the world anymore. And that's what he prays for here. And we all know it was just uh, sort of announced again as well that, uh, we, that you are all experiencing a transition too. One way or another, Reverend Nancy is about to retire. And now I'm not saying that Jesus is or that Nancy is Jesus, although I know that she is amazing, and she has done a fantastic job with you all. Just in the short amount of time that I've gotten to know her, I can see why she has been such a great pastor for you, and I can see why you love her dearly. But what I am saying is that we are all still Jesus's community in the world, experiencing or about to experience a specific transition. And I think Jesus's words here can be a guidepost as we go through the coming days and weeks and months. And there are three specific things that Jesus prays for here that I want to look at this morning. So the first one is this. A Yale professor and preacher named uh, Thomas Troger tells us that the community to which the author of John's gospel was writing to apparently had a desire to live apart from the world. He says that by the end of the first century CE, as conflict with authorities increased, the members of John's community were understandably attracted to a life of faith that would disengage them from the powers that were opposed to the gospel. 
The thinking goes like this then. By this point in the life of the church, Christians were starting to separate out from their early Jewish community to which they had belonged to for so long. Uh, and they were no longer under the limited protection that the Jewish community had under the Roman Empire. And so there had been persecutions and run-ins with authorities, and many felt like it would just be easier and better for them to practice their faith outside of the world, uh, or the, the cosmos in John's gospel, away from all of the forces that were being, that were opposed to Jesus's message. So outside of the reach of the empire, in the wilderness, or just generally sort of off on their own. But John knew that this was not what Jesus would have wanted for his followers. In fact, Jesus's ministry takes place within the world, in those towns and cities, and confronting that very same empire. And if Jesus is to be our model, then we are to do the same. So Jesus prays in this passage, says, I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. Their mission is to still be in the world, but even more so now, they do it with God's protection. And that's good because they're going to need it. Jesus does not ask them to remain in the world, just simply remain. No, he actually pushes them even farther into it. And in his prayer, he then says, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Professor Troger, again, remarking on this, says that this is the exact opposite of getting out of the world. In one clean and clear verse, Christ reminds the church that the pattern of his own life was not to escape from the world, but engagement with the world, with all of its distorted powers and pressures. It's in this that Christ reminds us of our mission. There are times during transitions when it's easier to just step back or step away to see how things play out before getting involved again. But Jesus's prayer is that we don't skip a beat after he's gone. And the second thing that Jesus prays for is this. Not only does he want them to keep doing what they're doing, he prays for perseverance and joy in that work. So wrapped up in this idea of being in the world is that they continue to do the work that they were doing before Jesus leaves. And what were those things? They were healing the sick, bringing good news to the poor and to the down, downtrodden, to comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable, to showing the world what a community centered around radical love and hospitality can look like, and because it's John's gospel, going to parties and turning water into wine. And if we can do those things, then Jesus promises his followers and promises us joy all the while doing those things. When I had my first interview with the PNC, they asked me which parts of the job description or the ministry information form attracted me to apply. And I told them that the big thing for me was that the church knew who it was and what it wanted to continue to do in the community and where it wanted to go in the future. They said that there were five things that the next pastor needed to display. Those were strong support for the LGBTQ community, support for immigrants and refugees, for women's equality, for Black Lives Matter, and for a commitment to peacekeeping. So yes, 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 and yes. This is where I feel called and where Christ calls his church into the world. If we can do those things, then there will be joy in this community and greater equity in our larger community. I told the PNC that I was ready to be a part of a community where all of these things were already understood, where we could get to the work that Christ has called us to do because we know that it is Christ who has called us to do it. Not because it's the hip or the fashionable thing to do, but because it is our calling and it's a joyful calling too. But I don't necessarily think that it is just a joy similar to uh, happiness. Certainly it can be that, but I think it's also more of a joy like satisfaction of knowing that we are doing what God has called us to do and a joy of worthwhileness, that if Jesus were to be here in the flesh today, these would be the things that Jesus would be doing. And that is a joy that doesn't fade or perish, but is renewed with each new day. And the third thing that I wanna point out is how Jesus understands the community's identity after he is gone. In verse 11, Jesus says, 
protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I think this is beautiful. Jesus is praying for them to understand that in all they do, the thing that keeps them together is their shared identity in the name of God. That they are not just called, but also claimed to be Christ's hands and feet in the world. And so that means it's not just our shared humanity that will keep, or not, that, not just their shared humanity that will keep them together, but their shared divinity as well. In other words, it's the image of God, as we are told in Genesis, that is in each one of them. None of them have all of it, but all of them have a part of it. Just like none of us have all of it, but we all have a part of God's image in us too. One of the things that Harry keeps repeating to me when talking about Lansdowne is the fact that you are all a family. And if I get it right, I think the exact quote that he uses is, we be family. I think that's right. And I understand that it would be that I would be stepping into relationships that are already formed. And so I'm excited to see that in action and to become a part of that family. But what Jesus tells us is that in the body of Christ, the church, the thing that keeps us together is our shared identity in the name of God. And I know from conversations with Nancy and the PNC that there is work to be done to bring this family even more closer together. This family of different races and ethnicities and genders sexual orientations, gender identities, nations of origin, all of these things that make us who we are, that make this church family of Lansdowne so amazing. But what I hope to focus on is that in all of the things that make us unique and different, it is that our shared identity in Christ will bind us and bind this community going forward. And I believe if we can find our shared identity first in how we are each children of God, created in God's image, in God's name, and that the image is beautiful in its diversity, then we will be able to take whatever situations and pressures and that the powers of the world will throw at us, throw our way, and that we'll be able to rise to meet them with joy and perseverance and love. In the name of the triune God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. The Finance Committee has asked me to remind you that you not only have the option of giving on Tithely regularly, but you can do a one-time shot on Tithely as well. It's fine. You just need to, you can log into Tithely through our church website. You have to have a credit card, but you can just put any amount, the larger the better, any amount you want on that, and uh, it'll get to the church. So however you give, Tithely, my back door, mail, having me come pick it up. I'm glad to do that. We appreciate your giving. It's, uh, it's an amazing thing to see, but you actually gave more money to the church last month than the church was able to spend. <laughs> wow, sir. How is that during a pandemic? We're the only church in town, ministerium met this week, we're the only church in town that can say that. So thank you. You are faithful in every way. Thank you. Thank you. Let's dedicate our offerings. Please pray with me. How will the world know that we are one unless we live as one? How will the world know of our love unless we resolve to address human needs? How will the world know of Jesus Christ unless that good news is shared by those who know him? Gracious God, we thankfully give ourselves and our gifts that the world might know. Amen. Many thanks to all of you who have already shared your joys and concerns. So uh, let's pray together. Lord, we see our neighbors hurting as they lose their jobs to layoffs and problems from the pandemics. We, we see our neighbors hurting as they lose their homes to foreclosure, their cars to repossessions. We pray that in the midst of turmoil, they may feel your presence and we might be feeling your move for us to help them. Lord, we pray this morning for our elected officials who are seeking solutions to this economic crisis, to world violence, to divisions. 
Help them not forget your guidance and your care and your direction. Gracious God, as we face the uncertain future in our nation, give us a spirit of integrity that would hold up those who are in severe distress. Help us to know that we are all your children made in the image of God. Lord, we pray for those who see no way, who are discouraged and hurt, who feel hopeless or alone. Move our hearts, open our hearts to help our neighbors and our community in their times of difficulty. This morning, God, we especially pray for all those who face sickness and disease. For Janice, for Elsa, for Claudette, for Lois and Joan, Walter and Ava, for Vlad and B and Derexa and Jerry. Gracious God, as we pray for them, we pray also, especially for those who are without the security of health care. We also pray that your grace would touch the heart of those who can help in this situation. There are many others whom we have named in our prayers earlier this morning, and we continue to think of Sade, of Pastor Ed and his family, of Mariana and her family, for Allison and Jonathan and the PNC. We pray for Jerusalem and the Palestinians and especially the people in Gaza. We pray for all those who suffer from such violence in Philadelphia and in places around the world. And finally, God, we pray for ourselves. Help us to be more kind. Help us to be more loving. Help us to be good neighbors. Help us not to stand idly by while suffering surrounds us. Oh God, make us instruments of justice, speaking truth to power and acting on your call to be good neighbors. All these things we pray in the name of your son who taught us to pray, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn is crown him with many crowns. That was good. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> well, this is indeed a momentous day. This is yes. a new day. It is, it is a you wonderful have day. Reflected well and wisely, I am convinced. It is a bittersweet day, though. Great choice. Yes. Uh -huh. In many ways, you're right, B, but uh, it's time. You know, uh -huh. it's been mm -hmm. 19 years on Tired. It's time. <laughs> it, I don't know. Nancy was going to go whether this, you know, whether we voted or not. <laughs> well, I have to. The board of pensions has all the paperwork. They say I'm out of here on uh, after June thirtieth. You can't argue with the board of pensions. Some people you can argue with, but not the board of pensions. So. I don't. I don't see Marie Louise or Sophie. Sophie, you did a great job. Oh, yes. 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 It was a long verse and she made it through. <laughs> it yes. was long.
And, and I just want to say, I am, I am grateful, and I'm going to say this to John too, for the one person who voted no to Jonathan, only because when you hired me, when you called me, you had all positives except one negative vote. And I've spent the last 19 years trying to find that person and win them. <laughs> Jonathan, find that one person and win them over to you. So, that's a good plan. Oh. Oh, yeah. Keep you honest. Yep. Oh, boy. Yeah, I bet you are breathing sighs of relief, PNC. I can I can hear yes. <laughs> yeah, Linda, yes. now you gotta find him a house. Sorry, Nancy, <laughs> it's not a PNC anymore. I'm sorry, yes. Oh. Bill, who's Clark, is, is uh, tasked with the responsibility of trying to keep me honest and above board and, and on, a, on a bright path. So thank you, Bill. They're not. Mm -hmm. Former PNC. We, we have a white smoke. We have a white smoke. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, leave it to Roger. Leave it to <laughs> I, I should probably go turn off the boiler then. <laughs> you know, it's uh, what the fifteenth. Good one, Rock. Good one. Probably could turn off the heat. Yeah, I, I'm kind of planning on doing that. You know, you know, Nancy, you shouldn't say within earshot of the buildings guide that we managed to collect more in a month than we spent, because he's like, I could spend that. <laughs> just yet wait a minute we don't want to scare him off before he gets here <laughs> no no no. we're turning it off we don't need we don't need to pay to heat anything anymore. yeah I, I don't need the, the heat running overnight to to make it 72 in the morning for the preschool and stuff when it's going to be all of 68 no matter what that's right Bed? Is it a oh, to me? Yeah. Yes, I did. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, happy belated birthday. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, golly. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh. All so, right, everyone. Have a good week. I love that. What was your date? Good luck at the track. The 12th. Okay. So it was Wednesday. I was the 11th. Okay. Ah, well, happy birthday, birthday to you, too, then. <laughs> Harry, if you can still hear us, great <laughs> job. Outstanding Woo! voting. Yes, yes, Harry. Yes. yes. Thank you. Harry. Good job, Harry. Good job. All these years of ministry, that was a first, but we got it done. So good day. <laughs> yes. Linda, the that house on my street is going up on the market the first week of June. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I'm fishing for good neighbors. Anybody want to live down the street?